Okay, welcome everyone to the April uh, SAN coordinator call. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad to have you all here today. Um, I do have Leah here to help us out if we have any um, any technical issues, but gosh, I missed Dan already because uh, he was very good at, at running these meetings. So um, welcome again. And uh, we have quite a full agenda of a variety of items that we wanted to share with you. To start with, um, I just wanted to say, those of you that attended the um, uh, SAN birthday party a couple of weeks ago, thank you for attending. We, we really enjoyed you know, the whole day. It was fun to hear a bit of history, work on some trivia, and uh, I've been going back and forth with Leah. We've been um, working with our vendor um, to get the um, party gifts out. So we are in process with the party gifts. So that is something that those that attended can look forward to in the near future. But we have wonderful submissions for the Build the Acronym contest. So I hope you'll go online. Um, you can find uh, some of, you can find the recording of the party as well as uh, the um, It Depends acronym building contest. And there were really some fantastic submissions, including a haiku, which I thought was really cool. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to move forward into our agenda for the day. You're going to see me popping back and forth between our agenda and the website. So I'm going to now share the website. Okay, so we are in um, renewal process season. So some of you reached out to us and asked for early um, invoices. We were very happy to do that. And we have had some submissions from coordinators of updates to their contact list. And we are very grateful for that as well, because we want to serve you well. So I thought that it would be really helpful today to show you where you can find, some of you already know this, but some where you can find the statement of work, which is our plan for each academic year. So uh, from the homepage, page, you see about SAN, you can get to it from that by clicking on SAN statement of work, which takes you to this page. The other way to do that, we'll go back to this, actually, we'll go back to the home page. So from the home page, you also can see the drop down. And there's the statement of work. So it got you to the exact same page. So multiple ways to get there. So what you find here is we're in SAN 10 currently up until June 30th, we're in SAN 10. So you can still reach that statement of work if you care to, uh, but the upcoming statement of work, which is which will discuss what SAN is, you know, in case you need to discuss this with staff members at your institution or your supervisors, you can share these um, items. So there's a downloadable copy of um, what SAN is and uh, what our benefits are, and most importantly, um, what our focus areas are for this upcoming year. Um, so you can see this is what, what we worked on with the advisory group and brainstormed. Dan and I also worked on this uh, along with the SAN advisory group and some input from other members um, who shared their thoughts uh, when we asked for them. And uh, so we've come up with these focus areas. That doesn't mean this is all that we work on for the year, but it's something that we definitely have target areas to be able to accomplish. And so that's when we um, arrive in the fall and we have our SAN annual meeting. I share you know, where we are with those focus areas. I give you all an update because it is really important for us to um, move through these items to help support what, what is important for you all. So you see those focus areas, and then there's the membership and renewal section. And in this section, we have not had a, an increase in several years. We did an adjustment. Um, instead of having a flat rate about three, four years ago, we went to a um, a different rate depending on how many institutions were part of the membership. So we have these, um, we have the chart here where we ask the coordinators to be responsible for sharing information, including like the login um, for the SAN website with your institution contacts. And we ask the coordinators to also be responsible for managing the contacts and keeping us up to date on that. And so we have some large memberships where we've offered them um, a uh, spreadsheet and we appreciate them keeping that spreadsheet up to date and sending us when the uh, new and remote and edited um, contacts so that we can keep that current and mix and they can be receiving our information. And so we have the how to join, but most importantly is the renewal section for you all. And what we're asking here, um, as we've discussed before, is that uh, we ask the coordinators to consult with their member institutions and update the contact information. And you do that just by sending it 
to, uh, to me. And so I will take those and share those with Leah and we will make sure that those um, changes are made for your membership. And if there are no changes, no worries there, you will automatically be renewed and an invoice is going out in mid-May. So the deadline for changes is coming up shortly before the before mid-May, May 14th. And uh, payments, we ask that they come in by July 1. We recognize that sometimes that, that is not, um, that is not something that uh, you can do if you're doing it as a part of next year's fiscal budget. And so this is why we use this target date so that if you're able to access funds at the end of your budget year, great. Or if you need to wait to the beginning of your next budget year, we are fine with that too. So, um, so you can see here that we have this renewal process. And I hope that you'll share with other contacts in your membership you know, the kinds of work that we're looking to do for the upcoming SAN year. And uh, you'll see some things are repeated because some things we continue to do this. Uh, we do some things every year because they are important to our membership. So you can have a look at our focus areas. You can see what our, our goals are for this upcoming year. All right. So I'm going to go back to. All right. Um, one of the things that was on that statement of work, if you caught it, um, I guess I went pretty fast, but uh, one of the things we want to do is also address what we have um, in terms of sectors and how state authorization or out of state activity compliance can vary based on the sector or what kind of sector work do we have going on. So we're going to be doing a, a new series called Member Spotlight, where we're going to be working with some of our memberships to bring forward some of the things that um, are uh, important in their membership to their institutions, and also maybe some of the unique perspectives that they have based on the type of um, institution that they are. And we're starting with the um, South Dakota Technical Colleges. And uh, the reason we're doing that is because we think that there could be an interesting perspective coming from our technical colleges and community colleges. And so uh, I reached out to Kelly and Marla, who are the coordinators for the South Dakota Technical Colleges group and asked if they wouldn't mind speaking with us today a little bit about you know, what, what are the challenges um, and how have you overcome um, bumps that you have uh, uh, have found with your state authorization work. So Marla and Kelly, are you with us? I'm looking down the list. Yeah, this is Marla. Oh, hi, and Marla. Hi, and yeah, Kelly's on, on the line too. And we also have Phoenicia. Oh, wonderful. Um, joining us from, from another one of our colleges. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start and we didn't prepare a, a PowerPoint or anything with slides. So we're just going to just kind of speak um, through the Zoom and, and share some, uh, some of the thoughts that we had. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, I'm on the call with um, my colleagues from Western Dakota Technical College and Southeast Technical College. And um, we're representing our South Dakota Technical Colleges. Um, we have four uh, schools in our in our system and um, we've kind of divvied up what we're going to share and I'm letting my colleagues introduce themselves as I just um, will talk about the a, a brief overview of of our system. So my name is Marla Smith and I'm the accreditation and institutional effectiveness director at Mitchell Technical College in Mitchell, South Dakota. Um, to start with some history, South Dakota a passed legislation in the 1960s to establish four vocational technical institutes um, back in the day. They were located in Rapid City, Sioux Falls, Watertown, and Mitchell. Um, they opened their doors in 1968. And um, through the 50 years that have ensued, we've um, evolved as I suppose most colleges and universities do through the years. Today we're, we're um, fully accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. And we offer a variety of Associate of Applied Science degrees, um, diplomas and certificates that um, are offered through a mix of online and face-to-face. Um, -face. And I, I suppose mostly face-to-face, -face, but we do each offer distance ed programs. Um, our programs have remained um, you know, with our commitment to provide um, pathways into workplace success. So our, uh, we do have health sciences, construction, business services, agriculture, 
IT, engineering, just a variety of, of programs uh, leading into, into technical careers. Um, Southeast Tech is um, our largest, well, probably both Lake Area Tech and Southeast Tech have about the same size of um, over 2,000 students in both of those institutions where Western Dakota and Mitchell Tech, we are um, about half that sized. Together, our fall enrollment was just over 7,100 students. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn the time um, over to Kelly to talk about some of the challenges that we face. Thank you, Marla. Uh, this is Kelly Olerking, and I'm the Vice President for Institutional Effectiveness and Student Success at Western Dakota Technical College. Um, been here a little over 30 years now, my 31st year, worn a lot of different hats during my time at the college, um, including teaching uh, for 20 of those years. Um, <clears throat> and when Cheryl asked us to speak today um, about how we approached state authorization um, among the four technical colleges. Uh, the, the thing that I was going to discuss with you are the challenges. And um, it's always interesting to me when I go to conferences or to different things with colleagues and all the different types of colleges and universities, public, private, 60,000 people to people like us with 1,300 people. And um, so it's, it, it's nice to have uh, the four technical colleges where we can work with each other because we have um, similar experiences and um, what the challenges are. So first of all, the number one challenge is we are small. So we wear a lot of hats. Um, every position here usually has multiple roles. So um, during my time of being part of state authorization, there's, um, it's always just been an add-on to someone's position. And so trying to even master what the law was doing, um, that was very overwhelming for me when um, I would just hear things on the outside. And then when I came in and um, really was able to like organizations like this that laid out the history, it was so helpful. Cause I was like, okay, I've heard this for 10 years now and what is going on? <laughs> so uh, one of the things being really small is being able to even follow the law. Um, we are unique in South Dakota in that our technical colleges are not part of our university system. So we do not have a board of regents. We do have our own board of trustees, but our board does not serve in a compliance role for us. Um, as far as we have no legal counsel through our board, um, our board does not stay on top of different laws and federal regs that are impacting the colleges. So it's really on each college to figure this out on their own. Um, and I'm not sure with the other three schools, but I know with Western Dakota, we don't have a dedicated legal counsel at our school either. Um, I am in charge of compliance at the school, but that's relatively new position um, starting in 2017 when we actually had a federal program review and um, they told our president we have to have someone in charge of compliance so that is one of the hats that I wear. Um, so the the small sizes um, wearing multiple hats having no centralized state office that um, has legal or watches legal things for us um, are a lot of the challenges that we have. Um, it can be very difficult for us to research. I can remember in the early days, it was like we had binders and we're looking and we finally got to the point where let's just pull students and what states are they coming from? And we'll just start with that. And then if a state was too difficult, like in the beginning, Minnesota was cost prohibitive to us. We just went take students from there. Um, so when Sarah came about in the NC Sarah and the state authorization groups, that was very helpful to us. And that is one thing we do partner with our Board of Regents on. They brought in the uh, two-year colleges in the state and um, they serve as our liaison in that role. But this type of organization and um, the work that these organizations do is in my opinion, just a godsend to us because um, like I said, I just don't know how being, how small we are and the resources we, um, have and not having the legal experts in the arena, how we would ever stay on top of it. So um, I would say that, that would, those were probably 
our biggest things to overcome as small schools in a state without a centralized system. So with that, I'll let uh, Phoenicia share. Hello, my name is Phoenicia Foster, and I'm an Associate Dean for Curriculum and Instruction, as I said, at Southeast Technical College, so we are in Sioux Falls. And my responsibilities include um, institutional effectiveness, accreditation, assessment, compliance, and general education. So with those, and I, I moved into this position last July, so I think as many of us can attest to, um, when we are new to a position, we don't really know what we don't know. Um, and so that could not be any truer of my experience this past year. I've been very grateful that we've been able to address and overcome some of the challenges that uh, Kelly just mentioned collectively. So uh, last fall, actually Kelly and Marla reached out and suggested that we join this particular group and so that we would have some additional access to, to resources and experts um, be, beyond our NC SARA membership. And at that same time, uh, we formed a, a local South Dakota SAN group so that we could really maximize our membership and more intentionally share between our colleges. Um, so the three of us have actually been meeting twice a month via Microsoft Teams and where we've covered some timely and relevant topics like professional licensure, complaints, consumer information, accessibility, especially with a focus on how they apply to state authorization. Um, and we've also, uh, as part of these bi-monthly meetings, we've invited our local campus experts um, or those that have that as part of their job description um, to join us or to present uh, when topics that pertain to them are on our agenda. And we do have four colleges in our system and I believe that that fourth college uh, will be joining us here in the near future. So I can't express how beneficial this particular organization's resources and our local group have been this past year. Um, I still really don't know what I don't know, but part of this meeting, um, Kel as part of our local meeting, Kelly and Marla have really patiently mentored me um, during our bi-monthly meetings, um, and they've also can, you know, shared emails and, and resources that I need to be aware of or that are relevant to questions that I've asked. So if you, I would highly recommend um, that you create a local group like we have, especially if you have colleagues that are new to their positions. So this has provided me a much better foundation to try and figure out what's going on rather than just to kind of uh, wade through it on my own or find out way after the fact. And although our small size um, is a challenge, we've also found that it can work to our advantage um, as we are able to easily get everyone in the same space and then get them up to speed um, when the, author the state authorization regulations and expectations change. So we do really appreciate this opportunity to share um, with you all what we're doing in South Dakota. Um, do you have any questions for us? Well, that was really fabulous. While everyone is um, getting a chance to put their questions in the chat, um, I just wanna thank you uh, for sharing that. I think what you expressed, I'm hearing from other groups as well. Um, I, I think maybe I've shared with one or more of you that um, I came from a community college, so I can understand the challenges when you hear what some of the other big institutions are able to do. But then, then they have other big institution challenges, um, even though they have um, staff perhaps, you know, in a way that a small institution does not. But certainly having a community is uh, clearly one of the, the best um, ways to be able to manage this type of compliance work. So I applaud you all for coordinating that in South Dakota and creating your own community. Um, we, we create the big community and I'm glad to hear the small communities are um, continuing to sprout up across the country. Are, are there any questions uh, for Phoenicia, Kelly and Marla? This is Kelly again. I did, and I agree with you, Cheryl. I think being small, we do have advantages and maybe look at that a little bit that like in my umbrella alone, I oversee registrar and financial aid. And then I used to work in the academics. So I have a real close relationship, but it's really probably much easier for us to get all offices, all people on board and in compliance with the regs because we are small. So that probably is an advantage. Um, over a really large school. I would empathize with what I have heard with larger schools of sometimes trying to get buy-in across college, um, at least for my college. I, don't, I do not have that issue because a lot of it is I supervise most of the groups that it impacts. So it's easier for me to implement. So I'd agree with that um, observation for sure. 
Well, I appreciate that, Kelly. I think what you also underscored is that um, the human factor in all of this is really important, being able to communicate with others, you know, uh, whether it's at a small, small institution because you have that kind of access or creating it across uh, a large and the word I hate siloed um, institution. So creating, and, and this is why we've always thought within our membership that the human factor is, is probably one of the biggest aspects that we try to grow. Um, in with uh, working with state authorization compliance. So I appreciate you underscoring that, Kelly. Any other thoughts or questions for our, for our South Dakota group? Well, again, thank you very much to Kelly, Phoenicia, and Marla. Um, we will be um, looking for another another group or either membership or institution, depending on the membership group, um, to be in our member spotlight over the next several months. If you're interested in being part of the member spotlight, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, but I do really appreciate South Dakota Technical Colleges Group for being our first. And so um, you provided really good information for us to get a perspective of how it works for you all to be able to manage compliance. So thank you very much uh, for doing that for us today. So moving on to our next item, I again am going to go back to the website. Of course, I zed out of it. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the Sensational Awards. And even in a pandemic, we want to do the Sensational Awards, uh, even more so to be able to, um, to um, celebrate you know, the kind of work that our institutions are doing to be able to manage compliance. And so um, the awards committee has already begun to work and get things in place um, to be able to have the 2021 Sensational Awards. And so uh, those of you that may not know this, we have an awards committee that consists of uh, Cheryl Thompson and Jeannie Yaki Fine, are our, our base members, our base people on this committee um, that have remained over the period of time. And then we've rotated previous winners. And so we have Cheryl Carroll and Brandy Elliott, who are serving in those roles as uh, previous um, Sensational Award winners. So I'm going to go to that page and you can find it by going under resources or by going down and then there the center square. And so here are the Sensational Awards. Now we will not be opening the um, uh, registration or the submissions for self nominations until June 14th, but we felt it was really important to share with you a bit about sensational awards. Um, and also how you can get the instructions so that you can start thinking about how you would like to put together a self nomination for your institution and to better help me, we've invited the Sensational um, Awards Committee uh, to be able to uh, tell us a little bit more um, about the Sensational Awards and what the uh, Awards Committee might be looking for and how to uh, submit for your self-nomination. So who, I, I saw Jeannie pop up. Any one of you would, I, I don't want to make any one of you, you know, be the first, but you, you're welcome to jump in at any point, but I did see Jeannie. So Jeannie, I'm gonna pick on you. Okay, I'm going off mute and- <laughs> Hi Jeannie, sorry I picked on you. You're the first name I saw, but I, there's probably others on as well. So thank you very much for jumping in. Sure, and, and I apologize. What uh, I heard you talking about us being, Cheryl and I and Cheryl Carroll and uh, being involved and in what's when it's coming, but what, I'm sorry, what would you like me to add to that? how great it is oh, to submit. Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, so again, as Cheryl mentioned, Cheryl Thompson and I have been doing this since the beginning. And we have seen amazing applications over the years. And in fact, there are times where it's like, okay, can we, you know, will we get applications as good as this the next year? And then we do. So, uh, you know, take a look at these various topics and please submit because the great thing is then after you are chosen, Cheryl has you present at upcoming uh, meetings, calls, and it's super helpful to share that information with other institutions who are in similar situations. I mean, that's what SAN is all about too, sharing with your peers and helping. And I think this is done, I sort of say I think, but I know. I know that through this process, so much 
has come about that has been super helpful to your peer institutions. So that's one of the best things about it. And I've said this in past years, do not be shy to submit. Don't assume that maybe yours won't be as good as someone else's application. Uh, make it your best, send it in, and we'll see what happens. That is great, Jeannie. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. And, you know, we really owe a debt of gratitude to Jeannie and uh, Cheryl Thompson for helping us get this started several years ago and uh, for them to help um, lead this project. Um, so we're, we're really glad to have this ability to keep it going. Um, we, I do see, Brandy, I'm going to pick on you. I see you there. So um, I, Brandy is serving on our committee as well. And if Brandy, you wouldn't mind coming off mute and talking a little bit maybe about um, as a person who's had to submit, you know, is there any tricks of the trade, any tips that you would have that you'd like to share um, with the other members about how to um, assess your program and how to then um, present it to the awards committee? Sure. Um, well, you know, state authorization can be confusing for everyone, um, from those who, of us who deal with it on a daily basis to faculty and students who have no idea why we need to do this. So uh, if you've done something or if you've discover, discovered something to make it easier to navigate the fluid landscape of state authorization, now is your time to shine. So if you've ever created a solution to a complex situation, I would encourage you to apply. Um, the, the actual process itself, the online form is very easy and they have prompts to help you uh, gather your thoughts. If you um, are not sure, you know, if this, if what you have is going to uh, be award worthy, I guess. But um, the University of Missouri, Kansas City has won twice in for our uh, state authorization website, which I'm, I'm very proud of. Um, but if you've done anything, you know, to make life easier for students, because this really impacts them, and that's why we're all here. So if if you've done anything to make their life easier, then uh, be sure to apply. That was great, Brandy. Thank you for adding that perspective for everyone. So I, I will obviously share this out again, but I just wanted to give the earliest opening for you all to be starting to think about submissions for the Sensation Awards. There is a window that is about a month long where these submissions will be accepted. So that's June 14th to July 16th. The awards committee will meet shortly after that. Um, look at the nominations and uh, will uh, choose the and there isn't just a winner. Um, they will assess all of them and then we could give multiple in a category or none in a category, depending on what the submissions are uh, for this year. So there, there is no um, requirement um, in terms of uh, how we um, determine those, um, the number of awards that we're going to give. And then, um, we will notify everyone in August um, whether they have been uh, chosen to win or not chosen to win an award for this year. But we hope that you will consider um, submitting uh, for uh, the 2021 Sensational Awards. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call. We will be opening up. You do not have to be. Sometimes people ask us, do you have to be a SAN coordinator uh, to submit? No, you don't. Um, so this is open to our entire membership. And so it will be in the next e-newsletter and we will put it prominently on the homepage of the SAN um, website so that everyone in the uh, SAN membership can, can um, take advantage of this opportunity. So uh, if you have any questions, like I said, don't, be, don't hesitate to be in touch. Um, what we will eventually do is move it to the top of the uh, page so that it's easier to find, but you can see that the call for nominations, instructions, and form are accessible um, from this link at the top of the page. And if you'll remember from the home page, the two ways to get to it under resources, sensational awards, or on the home page, you can go to the center square. And so um, and we hope you, go, you all will consider. Okay, so any questions about Sensational Awards? All right, well, if one pops into your mind, don't, um, don't hesitate to be in touch. 
So the last thing that I wanted to address before I talk about some of the upcoming events is uh, some of you have heard me talk about um, a NACUA briefing that I attended. And it really made a big impact on me because they were talking about interstate compliance, interstate regulatory compliance, but they were not talking about interstate regulatory compliance with higher education agency requirements, which, you know, as, as we know, you are either, you are either abiding by state by state or through reciprocity. We're talking about uh, requirements that are outside of the higher ed agency type requirements. And so specifically, the reason this came up under NACUA's radar was because it had to do with the pandemic causing um, staff members to be working remotely. And in some situations, the staff members were working remotely from another state. And I, I, I was really struck by the urgency for which the um, the presenters brought this issue forward as though this was something that nobody had ever considered before that you might have out of state um, out of state employees when I know and you know I'm, I'm reaching back to the conversation we just had about uh, small small schools technical colleges and community colleges I knew you know eight years ago that we had a dozen uh, faculty members teaching from out of state uh, you know ages ago, uh, pre-reciprocity. Pre uh, so uh, what they brought forward with these issues were things that are really related to employment law. They're, um, you know, we're talking about um, issues of taxes, we're talking about issues of um, benefits, uh, also in terms of registration. And I'll go through each of those. And I bring these to your attention, not because I think at your institution, you will be the person who manages all the compliance aspects of this, but it's just something that within your work that you understand as, as we are people who deal with interstate compliance, we deal with out of state activities, that we are able to have conversations with the other folks at our, in our institutions that are managing this type of work. And this, this will probably be the HR and, and accounting group that deal with this primarily, but you need to be aware of it, especially, you know, we, we talked pre-reciprocity about the idea of um, marketing and how institutions would get really excited about offering marketing opportunities, and yet they didn't understand that there would be an institutional compliance aspect with that. Uh, and, and here, we're, we're having the situation where we could be having more employees and, and faculty members across state lines uh, because we're, we're reevaluating that, you know, as we're coming out of the pandemic. So, so I, I, I'm sharing this with you. Um, so they brought it to the idea that this is focused on the fact that the pandemic sent people to work from home and that some were some actually relocated. And so it's, it's to be aware of these kinds of things. So um, they suggested that prudent employers are considering future remote employees. Yes, we know that there have been remote faculty and staff related to distance education, but there could be more now. So this is an activity that may be subject to state oversight um, in some states by the higher ed ag agency and is subject to reciprocity through SARA, but also could have this other component with other entities, such as a tax entity. They're called different things in different states, whether it's Department of Taxation, Taxation and Revenue, um, or could also be a Department of Labor issue, um, and also consider um, uh, the um, benefits issues um, that could be related to, fact, to um, employees. So uh, the two biggest things that they mentioned that um, institutions need to be aware of is, this will surprise you, tracking your faculty and staff. I said that very sarcastically, um, because as you all know, we have been talking about tracking our out-of-state activities for years, but they mentioned that as their number one priority. And then an institution needing guidelines and expectations at the institution, which makes sense. So um, the, the types of areas uh, that were, were first brought up was first having to do with taxes. And uh, the way this uh, first attorney brought it out, uh, she indicated because of federalism, every state has sovereignty to enact its own tax laws. There is little or no uniformity among the states and their approaches. Well, we've dealt with that kind of issue um, ourselves. So we know that this is very consistent with the kind of um, state interaction that we've had. So tax laws will vary state to state. 
she said there were basically two perspectives. The employer um, must be aware of if the, if the institution is to be subject to a corporate income tax in another jurisdiction. Typically tax exempt and nonprofits, uh, excuse me, typically tax exempt for nonprofits and public. However, there was also talk about the employee where the employee is, could they could be subject to personal income, state income tax. There could be personal state income tax and determining how much should the institution be um, managing the withholding from their check. So the bottom line is that they suggest that the institution must figure out what the obligation is in each state for tax withholding. So the obligations that could occur, um, does the employer have a duty to, to um, to withhold state tax? Uh, does the employee working out of state subject the institution to any corporate taxpayer obligations in that state? And so, um, you know, we've addressed this uh, to some degree, sometimes when we've talked about out of state, um, excuse me, out of country employees, um, but this we're talking about out of state employees and the tax implications. Um, so that was the tax implication. So second, thought that they had was any kind of registration as a foreign corporation. So we've talked, we as SAN have talked about um, whether offering distance education in the state might subject the, the institution to registering um, within a state. But what we're talking about here is having to do with an employee. And so when an employee is working remotely in the state, you know, would that cause the institution to have to register with the state? And, you know, just like with the taxes, the states vary widely. So the example that they gave was an employee working in Illinois requires the institution to register with the Illinois Department of Revenue and withhold Illinois state taxes if the employer has the employee performing duties from Illinois for more than 30 days. So they were talking about the temporary type of situation that maybe the pandemic may have brought about, but now the more permanent if the employee is there for more than 30 days. And so that was their example. And so, um, you know, so that was registration. So we had taxes, we've got registration. Then we have workers' compensation insurance. And so we've talked as a SAN Institute, as a SAN uh, membership group, about the situation when um, there's a student who's participating in a field experience. And we're re we recognize that the state of Colorado uh, requires workers' compensation insurance uh, for that situation, except for teaching. Uh, but now we're talking about the... Um, the obligation for the employee who's working in another state. And so it's checking with our workers' compensation insurance carrier to make sure that the institution has coverage for that employee in the jurisdiction where they're working. So again, it's another situation. We were talking about just students who are participating in a field experience. Now we're talking about, do we have employees and do we have a workers' compensation issue for the um, insurance issue for an employee that's in the other state? And the other thing that they brought up, which I thought was really interesting, is that employees, employers are responsible for providing safe work environment for employees who work remotely. And so they're suggesting that the institution should have a remote work policy that outlines expectations for the remote site from which they're working and also talk about setting hours and um, travel situations. So what I'm hearing is that these um, presenters were expecting that institutions may develop a more formal manner for which they're um, um, using it where they're uh, working with the out-of-state faculty or staff members at the institution to have something in a more formal formal structure. Um, and let's see, uh, unemployment insurance benefits generally determined by the employee's physical presence in a state. So having to determine how and what to pay for unemployment coverage in that state where, this, where the employee is located. So what we've seen so far, again, we've talked about tax implications, so it's going to vary by state. We talked about whether there must be registration as a foreign corporation, that's going to vary by state. And then also, is there workers, compens workers compensation insurance coverage that must be managed if we have an employee working from another state? And then finally, they talked about 
health insurance benefits. So um, the institutions should be aware if the insurers um, and brokers, you know, what kind of options are there if the employee is working uh, in another state? Sometimes those, uh, the insurance coverage is regional. And so it's kind of dependent upon what kind of insurance they're, they're um, providing and whether it will reach the employee who is working yet in another state. So it, what was very interesting about this was the um, attorney mentioned that the institution may want to consider, and this is a, an interesting phrase she used, um, she says that it's not generally workable to have free range employees, meaning that their inst the institution's employees could be anywhere, that the institution's gonna wanna have some kind of say about, and, and some kind of process, some kind of um, uh, procedure at their institution to determine how they will manage an out-of-state employee slash faculty member. So, um, and then they also mentioned that, of course, if it's a hybrid situation, that gets even more complicated and uh, it'll be a state by state situation there as well. So I think the, the, the bottom line is that there, um, as we've talked before, because we have talked about tax implications before, that these are outside of the higher education agency oversight slash reciprocity through Sarah oversight um, situation. These are the other state agencies that may have some sort of interest in the activity that is occurring within their state. And so it's being aware of that. You all as compliance staff members, um, maybe at a big institution, you would have others that will manage this, but you need to have an awareness of, you know, that there are a variety of things if your institution is looking to expand programs or expand opportunities for their faculty members or staff members to work from an out of state location. Um, let's see. Uh, we had somebody ask me if I would repeat the Illinois situation. Yes, I'd be happy to. The example that was provided indicated that the institution has an employee working in Illinois. So Illinois state requires the institution to register with the Illinois Department of Revenue and withhold Illinois state taxes if the employer has the employee working uh, duties from Illinois for more than 30 days. Now, I should caution you that this was an example that was just given as far as a general example. Its applicability to all types of institutions could be varied. Um, so if a nonprofit private institution versus a public institution versus a uh, for-profit institution, they wanted to give this general type of an example just to see what could be the ultimate implications. So it's just being aware that there could be this varied situation in terms of your employees in another location. Okay, another question. If an institution has employees in every state, should we ensure that there is workers' compensation insurance in each state or will one general policy be adequate? That's a very good question. And, and I'm sorry that I am, I am the delivery man today in terms of um, what I heard. I'm trying to summarize what I heard in this briefing as I you know, had my jaw on the floor for most of it, trying to um, learn and re-listen to, um, to the summary so I could absorb a lot to, to share with you. But I would say this, that in terms of um, the workers' compensation, I would talk with your HR department and talk about you know, how they're managing this. This could be something that I would anticipate at your institution, um, you know, you're already doing something like this given the, um, the diverse uh, um, um, student base that you have, that it wouldn't surprise me if your institutions already uh, addressed this, but I would talk with your HR about that. Um, and yes, I would be glad to provide kind of a written summary and I'll put it in mix um, about this, but I first wanted to uh, share it with you all verbally so I could see what kind of priorities you all have, but I see, um, you know, what you're, what you're sharing and that will help inform, you know, how I outline this uh, for you to share. And this is something that is part of um, some of the work that we're going to be doing uh, next year as well to try to get um, more concrete information about this and also about the what we're seeing as a as a um, evolving situation with digital uh, sales tax, because we're seeing that states, you know, we've talked a lot about how um, technology is ahead of the law. And so the law is starting to catch up. 
and that we're hearing in some states that they're considering digital sales tax that will include online um, education i'm um, taxing online education of out-of-state institutions and so we want to it's in the beginning of that unfolding so um i've reached out to uh one of our colleague law firms um you know to find out what they're learning they're right with us in terms of you know trying to get their arms around it as well so it's something that we will keep you all informed about um but certainly as uh interstate compliance is is the focus of our uh, organization we will continue to um to share things as they unfold franchise yes uh kelly's bringing up about franchise taxes um let's see the regulations by state um we do uh, the, here's the issue um with asking about regulations by state this situation is going to be um varied by entity and so we can dive into it um but i think that that's something that is going to be you know um even more broad than just interpreting uh the kinds of requirements that came out of the higher ed agency you know it's it's um so we're talking about different tax agencies we're talking about different we do have the contact information for um secretary of state or adjacent you know because sometimes they vary in title as well so you do have contact information for that um but we will continue to press to find out more of what we can um certainly in terms of the digital sales tax that's in its infancy so i do have an, a great article that i'm going to share that i just found today actually that i want to share and mix with you all about um sales digital sales taxes with the caveat that they are continuing to evolve um let's see and yeah, so uh, just know that this is something that is on the horizon for SAN 11 that we will be diving into. And um, we are, as you all know, we're in process of hiring um, a new director for uh, interstate uh, policy and um, compliance. So this is certainly one of the topic areas that we you know, have uh, as a part of that issue, uh, part of that person's uh, work coming up. Oh my goodness, on a related subject, will this impact biometric privacy laws? Oh God, Yolanda, um, um, I appreciate the question. I'm just saying it in terms of my mind is blown. Um, so some states have those coming. So yes, so here's the situation. Um, we are always talking about technology being ahead of the law. And so we're going to play catch up as things evolve in terms of, and I didn't even have biometric privacy on my radar, but I do now. Um, so we will have that. We certainly have been following um the various state privacy laws and data protection laws that have been coming up so far the states that have enacted them um which is just two um have um exempt um the um um higher ed so that does help um generally speaking so uh we will keep working on that but yolanda thanks for putting that on my radar so that was a mouthful of information that I shared with you, but I just I wanted to plant the seed that there are these other state agencies that you should be aware of and that these conversations would be appropriate with your HR and accounting um, or any other um, uh, office that does that kind of work at your institution. And, um, you know, we'll continue to share. Um, I like the idea. Thank you very much about the outline to share with you all um, that I will put in mix. And um, we will just keep pushing this one forward. Any other questions that you think I can try to um, at least point you in a direction um, at this point? You know, again, I'm the messenger today and just wanting to share a summary of what I learned, but it's certainly something we want to dive more into. Okay, nobody wants to blow my mind more than Yolanda did. So Yolanda, you win um, for blowing my mind for an area. So, um, okay, so that was, that was our business for today. And so I want to share a little bit about some announcements um, coming up. Uh, we have um, some, some great opportunities that I want you all to be aware of. First of all, um, you all as coordinators probably have more experience at your institutions, but perhaps some of your institution contacts, um, you know, would be interested in the SAN Basics Workshop being virtual. You all may recall that last year's SAN Basics Workshop that was to be held in June got postponed because I 
uh, naively thought we could meet together in September last year, which of course it then turned virtual and we kept it to half um, of our normal size so that we can learn how to um, put a virtual workshop together. So I appreciated the patience of the, pres uh, the presenters and mentors, and we have moved back to our regular size. So there will be a 50 maximum, 50 person maximum for the SAM Basics workshop in June. So we are taking registrations. Um, there is a, a SAM member code. It depends, all one word, all caps. And uh, so it's $250 um, at this point. Uh, right now up and for the early bird and I believe the early bird goes to the end of May for this June workshop. So I, I strongly urge you um, to share this information with those at your institution that could benefit um, from the basics workshop. The next open forum in a few weeks is going to is going to be May 11th. So that's the second Tuesday of the month. And uh, we're gonna have a special guest host. I unfortunately have a conflict and uh, Megan Raymond, my colleague with WCET, um, will be uh, your guest host and expert of the month. And uh, we're gonna be sharing about the benefits of WCET. I've been talking with some coordinators lately that um, don't have the, the, their role does not really um, offer them the opportunity to get the maximum out of the benefits of WCT, but there are other staff members at their institution that would. And so Megan's gonna talk a little bit about those benefits and also about the policy and practice issues that WCET does address. Certainly there is some crossover with SAN. SAN is the group that dives deeper into building tools and building resources um, to manage compliance, but there are a lot of wonderful policy and practice issues um, that um, are shared and developed, you know, um, through WCET. And I, I strongly urge you um, to uh, consider that. And then, of course, the upcoming WCET events, she will share more about that. Uh, the next of the policy series for which SAN members are um, welcome to join, um, and it's free, the next one is going to be about professional licensure notifications. And uh, so that is meant to be, this policy series has predominantly been um, an opportunity for people to come on, hear a 15 minute spiel basically about what the issue is. We just did regular and substantive interaction the other day. Um, so we're gonna be doing professional licensure notifications. It's gonna be Russ Poulin, um, myself and Jeannie Yaki Fine. Uh, it'll be moderated by Van Davis. And we wanna give the people who are registered the opportunity to have about 45 minutes of dialogue with us. So we're gonna answer questions and, and talk um, practically about you know, how to manage these professional licensure notifications. And so also coming up um, is uh, the, uh, put on your calendar, the one day, um, annual meeting for WCET. They will not be in person this year, which means that our annual meeting will not be in person either. We will create a SAN virtual annual meeting. Um, you know, we, we did one last year and uh, we'll consider some of the aspects of that. I heard everybody really liked the interactive part. And so I wanna make sure that we um, have a good interactive part um, in ours as well, but we'll be developing that style. We'll work with the uh, SAN advisory group um, to help create a good one day annual event um, for SAN coordinators uh, next fall. So we're looking forward to that. Um, also, if you missed it, the SAN podcast, uh, the last Dan Silverman SAN podcast, and we will continue with them, but the last one where Dan was host uh, was our guests, Russ Poulin and Meg Megan Raymond, who talked about how uh, SAN was developed and uh, what those early days looked like back in 2011, which you know I find is steeped in history, so I really found it interesting, which is why the um, party that we had having uh, Marshall Hill and uh, Cheryl Thompson and Michael Goldstein and uh, Alan Contreras talk about um, you know, auth state authorization and the compliance aspects and how we got started is, is, is really, was really interesting. Uh, so any questions about our upcoming events or any of the issues that we addressed today? Well, I want to thank um, the the folks from the South Dakota Technical Colleges. You know, having uh, Marla, Phoenicia, and Kelly opening us up with that project, um, with that uh, new series, was really great. So, thank you very much for being on today, and I thank Jeannie 
uh, Yaki Fine for talking with us about the Sensational Awards and Brandy providing her personal perspective on the Sensational Awards. That was really helpful. And I appreciated the questions on the interstate compliance nuances that we're learning. And uh, we will provide more as, the, as we learn about them. But in the meantime, we all please, if you um, have not had a chance, if you're a larger membership, especially to give us an update to your contacts, for SAN 11, we would really appreciate it because we want to make sure that we're serving your membership well. So thanks, everyone. Um, you know, please be in touch, and uh, we will be talking with everyone soon. Have a great afternoon. Bye bye.